Welcome to chapter two. Now chapter two is going to correspond very well with some of the things that you're doing with your virtual lab, those Learn Smart Lab activities. So uh, you know, be sure before you get too far into your lab activities that you've been through this this chapter and these video lectures and you've done your reading and understand some of the background. And a lot of what you're learning about here by reading chapter two or and or listening to these video lectures and taking notes, of course will um, make more sense as you go through those virtual laboratory activities. So the first topic, and again, not all the information in Chapter 2 is required for this course. So you want to use your study guide, learning objectives document, and um, as, as the guide for what you actually have to, to learn from this chapter. There are things in this chapter that you're going to learn more gradually as you go through the, the rest of the course and especially through some of those laboratory activities. All right, first uh, video clip here we're going to talk about culturing microorganisms in the laboratory, which is basically a fancy way of saying we're going to grow them in the laboratory. So if we want to study microorganisms or identify them, diagnose what's causing an infection, uh, traditionally we've had to be able to grow them in the laboratory. And sometimes that's very easy to do, and for some microorganisms, it's not so easy to do. Now, things are changing, so now we have these DNA-based techniques, genetic-based techniques that are uh, very similar to what people in forensic science use, for example. And those types of techniques are beginning to change um, some of the traditional requirements for culturing or growing microbes in the laboratory. We're probably not too far from the point where you'll just be able to do DNA testing on a microbe and identify what it is um, without even having to grow things in the laboratory, but we're not quite there yet. Alright, so your textbook points out five eyes of microbiology when you're working with microorganisms in the laboratory, and so I kind of like this. Uh, one of those is inoculation. So if you're going to grow microorganisms in the laboratory, you need to put them into a substance that's going to allow them to grow, and that's called inoculation. You're inoculating the culture medium, the substance on or in which that microorganism is going to grow. Incubation, so you guys know what incubate means. You put it into some environment that's going to be with a proper temperature for that microorganism to grow. Then isolation, so if you think about it, if you swabbed the inside of your mouth, there are going to be lots and lots of different types of microorganisms there. And isolation means you are separating out those different types of, of microorganisms so that you can study or identify them separately or independently. That's called isolation. Inspection, you grow a culture in the laboratory, you look at it, you inspect it, you, you take note of its different properties. Then finally, identification. That's where you get down to the level of, all right, I've got this culture of microorganisms and I'm going to figure out exactly what species it is. Okay, so here's a figure from your book. Um, this is showing you those first two eyes, inoculation and incubation. I just talked a little bit about this, but there are different ways that you can inoculate do inoculations in the laboratory. So this is where you're taking microorganisms and putting them into some sort of substance that will allow them to grow. And over here on the left, we've got a petri dish, and this has a substance in it called agar, which you'll be learning about on your Learn Smart Labs activity. It's kind of a gelatin-like substance that has nutrients in it. And so you can take bacteria. Bacteria love to grow on uh, what we call agar media with lots of nutrients in it. So here you got like a little wire loop and that wire loop has a sample of bacteria on it and you streak it across this auger plate and that is a type of inoculation. You would then take that plate and put it over here in an incubator, an environment with a proper temperature to allow that, that type of bacteria to grow. Um, some microorganisms have traditionally been grown in blood bottles. It just depends on the type of microorganism. Some things need very, very rich culture media with lots of nutrients in it, and, and blood is very nutrient rich. And if you look over here, here's another type of inoculation. Uh, this is a bird embryo inside of an egg, 
chicken eggs were, were typically used. And this was a way of culturing viruses. So we've, we've talked a little bit about how viruses must have some sort of host to be able to survive some other living thing, some living thing, viruses are not truly living, but uh, viruses need a living host in order to be able to survive. So over here on a Petri dish, um, if you've got a type of culture medium that's just nutrients with this auger gelatin-like substance in it, that's not a host. There's no living host there for a virus to survive. So one of the ways that viruses were grown in the laboratory traditionally was to inject them into embryonated bird eggs and let them infect the poor little embryos and multiply inside those embryos to increase their numbers. All right, again, incubation is you're putting cultures in an environment with the proper temperature to allow them to grow. Uh, a lot of times the incubator temperature is going to be 37 degrees Celsius when we're when we're trying to grow microorganisms that that uh, infect humans and cause disease in humans. Not 37 degrees Celsius is about 98.6 Fahrenheit. And so what's the significance of that? That's human body temperature. So if you think about it, if some microorganism is capable of causing disease in humans, it better be well adapted to human body temperature. Not all microorganisms are. Uh, that temperature can be too warm for many types of microorganisms. And so typically in a, a medical microbiology or a clinical microbiology laboratory, cultures are incubated at 37 degrees Celsius because that generally tends to be ideal for the types of microbes that, that we're interested in. But some types of microbes grow better at room temperature, for example, cooler types of conditions. Oops, hang on. All right, and then how about those other three eyes like I was just talking about? The third one is isolation. And so as I mentioned, let's say you had a sample from a patient's wound or a urine sample. And there are multiple types of species in there. Isolation, you might streak those that sample with mixed organisms in it onto a petri dish in the laboratory and that will hopefully separate out individual species and that's called isolation and then you can sample so while you see those spots there on the petri dish those are colonies of purified bacterial species so you can then using good techniques sample bacteria from an isolated colony of those organisms on that plate and put that into a culture in a laboratory and grow up much larger numbers of that purified, isolated species so that you can study it. Again, you're gonna be hearing a lot more about this on your Learn Smart Laboratories activities. And finally, inspection. You look at your cultures. What color are they? Did they grow well? Did they grow poorly? Um, you can sample microbes and look at them under the microscope to help you with the last eye, which is identification. That's where we're, we're doing things in the laboratory to, to figure out exactly what species of microorganism we have cultured in the laboratory. And that can be done through microscopy, various tests that you run, and you'll see lots of examples of that as we move through the, the virtual laboratory exercises. DNA analysis, like I was just pointing out, that's where things are kind of moving. Immunologic tests, and we'll talk more about that at the end of the semester as well. Things like a rapid strep test you might have in a doctor's office. Uh, those actually use antibodies, which I already mentioned back in chapter one as being protein weapons of immune systems. But these antibodies are so specific about what they attach to, they can actually be used for identification or diagnosis in a laboratory. And those are immunologic types of tests. And you've had experience with those tests without even knowing it. If you've had a rapid strep test, if you've had a pregnancy test, that's a type of immunologic test. Okay, so the substances in the laboratory that are used to grow microorganisms are called culture media. Medium is the singular form of the word. Media is plural. And we have three major types. 
We have liquids, which are also sometimes called broths. You can have broth media. And uh, so these are liquids that contain nutrients in them. You put your microorganisms in there um, and they multiply. You incubate them at the proper temperature. They're going to multiply and, um, and grow to very large numbers. Uh, it usually causes the broth to turn cloudy. And another term for that is turbid. So if you take a sample of bacteria in a lab and put it into a broth culture medium and you incubate it and you come back later and it looks cloudy, that lets you know that your the organism actually grew in that broth culture medium. All right, then we have some types of media that are called semi-solid and then solid. So a solid medium and semi-solid generally contain a substance called agar, which I just mentioned a little bit earlier. Agar is actually a polysaccharide derived from seaweed, and agar is a thickening agent. So if you think about jello, if you've ever made jello in the kitchen before, gelatin is also a thickening agent. And you know how you heat up jello and the jello doesn't dissolve until it boils. Same thing with auger, and then you have to let it cool down and the, the gelatin solidifies and gives you a, a solid type of substance. And auger is much the same way. So you have to boil it to get it to dissolve and go into solution. And then as that auger solidifies, it creates a solid type of culture medium surface. Nice thing about auger, so with jello, so traditionally in microbiology laboratories, gelatin was used as the substance to give you a solid surface on which to grow microorganisms. But a lot of microorganisms can actually break down gelatin or liquefy it. Um, but most microorganisms don't break down agar very well. It's a complex polysaccharide, again, that actually comes from, from seaweed. A semi-solid type of culture medium is kind of in between a liquid and a solid form. So it, it has agar in it and it is solid, but it still contains a lot of liquid. So it's kind of ooey and, and gushy. And there are some uses for that type of medium in the microbiology lab. Okay, this is a diagram which is showing you some various conditions that cultures of microorganisms, and these are all uh, bacteria that you see here in the, the pictures from your textbook. First of all, those solid types of culture media that have nutrients and agar in them give you surfaces on which to grow microorganisms. A broth is just gonna give you a big cloudy uh, mixture of tons and tons and tons of bacterial cells. So you can generally characterize microorganisms better on the solid media where they form colonies or clusters. And you can look at the, the sizes and the shapes of the colonies and, and their different characteristics like the color and texture and so forth. All right, so a culture can exist in different forms. So a pure culture, you wanna know what that phrase refers to. That means you have only one type of microorganism in your culture. So they all look alike, like you see here, you've got three different tubes and you've got auger inside those tubes and the auger is on a slanted surface. Slants are going to be discussed on one of your Learn Smart Labs activities and that gives you a, a, a large surface area on which to grow high numbers of a, of a microorganism and you can see those all the same color and so forth and that lets you know you probably have a pure culture. A mixed culture here we've got a petri dish. You can see part of the petri dish. And notice you've got yellow colonies, those little spots on there, and white colonies. So a colony on an auger surface in the laboratory theoretically starts from one cell. So you spread out a bunch of individual microbial cells on this auger. You incubate. One cell divides into two, two into four, four into eight, eight into 16, and eventually you're up in the millions and the billions and trillions. And so if you have colonies that are well separated from each other, they should be pure species. But on a, on a single Petri dish like this, if you see colonies that are obviously different, have different characteristics, 
that's letting you know you don't have a pure culture. You've got a mixed culture of one or of uh, more than one organism on that particular plate. And then what's a contaminated culture? So a contaminated culture uh, is one where you have an organism in the culture that you don't want to be in there. So like on this Petri dish you see here, lots of red colonies and red streaks over here. That was almost certainly the organism that was supposed to have been grown on this auger plate, but we see some white growth in there as well. So that's some sort of unwanted contaminant that got into the culture, perhaps from using poor technique in the laboratory when setting up the culture. So you want to pay very close attention to that on the aseptic technique, learn smart labs activity. Um, or it might have come in from the air when the culture was being set up. That's also part of using good aseptic technique. So we would call that a contaminated culture. In a mixed culture, a lot of times too, in a mixed culture, um, you may know the identities. You've just got more than one type in there. In a contaminated culture, you don't likely know the identity of what organism has contaminated your culture. It's an intruder. All right, some terminology here. So I'm a big stickler for this term, sterile, sterility and contamination. So contamination, again, this is where an unwanted organism gets into a laboratory culture. So you're trying to grow Escherichia coli and some other organism gets in there, unwanted, messing up your culture. Sterile, what does sterile mean? Sterile means a complete absence of detectable living things, microorganisms or viruses. So that term gets used improperly lots of times. My, uh, my first microbiology professor back when I was in college, back in the 1980s, told us sterile is kind of like pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's no in between. It's the same thing with sterile. You're either, something is either sterile or it's not sterile. So you can't be kind of sterile, almost sterile, sort of sterile. Uh, something is either sterile or it's not. And sterile means you can't detect any microorganisms of any kind in whatever substance that is. And so in a laboratory, when you're working with all these components, you're trying to culture a particular microorganism, you need to use technique. You're using all sterile supplies because you don't want unwanted microorganisms in there growing and contaminating your culture. And you have to use techniques that will hopefully maintain the sterility of your supplies and your culture media and so forth until you put in the organism the sample that you want to actually grow. So I do want you guys to be sure you understand what that term sterile means. And when you spray um, a disinfectant of some type on your kitchen counter and wipe it up, you are not sterilizing your kitchen counters. You are disinfecting them. You're reducing the number of microorganisms, but you're not actually killing all of those microorganisms. So you're not truly sterilizing something in that way. And we'll talk more about that when we get to chapter uh, nine later in the semester. Okay, so with culture media, so we said culture media are these substances that are used to grow microorganisms in the laboratory. And there are different types of culture media that can be used. Uh, enriched media, kind of as the name suggests, those are culture media with lots and lots and lots of nutrients in them and favorable for the growth of a number of different types of microorganisms. Selective media, and a lot of times in the laboratory you use what are called selective media. So selective media may have limited nutrients in them. Not all microorganisms can use every kind of nutrient for survival. So selective media may be limited in nutrients so that only certain kinds of microorganisms can grow on the culture medium and others cannot. Or there might be something about the culture medium that allows some organisms to grow and others to not. For example, the pH might be favorable for some microorganisms or not for others. Or there might be a really high salt content and that very high salt uh, condition favors the growth of some microorganisms but inhibits others. So any type of 
culture medium that behaves that way is called a selective medium. It allows some organisms to grow, prevents the growth or inhibits the growth of others. A differential medium has substances in it that cause some microorganisms to develop a color usually. So like you see over here, this is a, a picture of bacteria. You've got different bacterial colonies on here, some big, some small, different shapes and so forth. And um, notice some of them are yellow and some have take on a reddish tint. So there is a substance in that culture medium which is causing some colonies to take on a red color. And that tells you something about the microorganism and its lifestyle, its properties, that can ultimately help you with identification. So that's called a, a differential type of medium. And a lot of culture media are both. They're selective and differential. A lot of that will make more sense as you, we get into uh, some of your laboratory activities later in the semester where you're running different types of, of tests to identify an unknown organism. Many of the, the tests that are run use selective and differential media, and you kind of keep track. My organism can grow in this, it can't grow in this. When it grows in this, the culture medium turns yellow, or it stays red, uh, or it turns green. These types of things are held, used as kind of yes-no tests to narrow down the identity of, a, of an organism. And again, a lot of that will make more sense when you as you move farther into the semester. All right, here's some diagrams from your textbook. They're showing a little bit more about what I just mentioned. So if you have a, let's say you have a liquid culture in the lab with lots of different organisms in it, or maybe this is a body fluid sample from a patient. If you put that on a general purpose, non-selective medium, everything's gonna grow. You're gonna have lots of species there. Um, on a selective medium, you might only have one species out of this mixture that's capable of growing. So whatever is in there has inhibited all of the others and is allowing only one type of organism to grow. That would be selective. Uh, a differential medium over here, again, causes some color changes. Usually something happens that allows you to distinguish between one type of organism versus another. Uh, based on some kind of characteristic that develops on that medium. A lot of times, again, you put the two together and you have selective and differential. All right, how about that isolation I? All right, so I talked a little bit about this earlier. Typically, in a laboratory, you start with a sample that has a mixture of microorganisms in it. And so they're using it as an example over here. Let's say we've got uh, two different types of bacteria here. We've got a yellow rod-shaped type of bacteria and a white round shape of bacteria. So that's what they would look like if you were looking at those cells under a microscope. And then you spread that mixture of these individual cells across this petri dish over here. And when you do that, you're going to get a, column, a, a cell here, a cell here, a cell here, a cell here. And that's what they're showing. If you spread them out enough on the plate, you're going to separate out individual cells. You incubate. Those individual cells will form colonies as they divide. And as I mentioned earlier, individual colonies generally represent pure species if they're well separated from each other on your auger dish that you've grown in the laboratory. So this is isolation. You've started with a mixed sample and now you've got isolated species of microorganisms separated from each other on the plate. And then you can sample cells from those individual colonies, look at them under a microscope, or transfer them into new cultures. Transfer, culture transfer is an important concept, so that you can run various types of tests on it and actually identify what type of organism that is. In order to get colonies like this and to separate individual species in a mixture into unique separated colonies. You've got to have a medium with a firm surface. This is generally done in, in a petri dish. And of course, you've got to have proper inoculating tools to set up those cultures. And you're going to have a Learn Smart Lab activity that will go into a lot more detail about that.
Your textbook discusses some different methods for isolating bacteria from a mixture and read about these in your textbook. Um, a streak plate is probably the most commonly performed method for isolating bacteria and this is where you take an inoculating loop and you've got a sample that has lots of different um, microorganisms in the mixture and you streak it across the plate um, into different sections and it, when you first start off you've got a, a mixture of lots and lots and lots of different microorganisms in there together and as you keep streaking it out on the plate over and over and over you dilute these individual cells out and eventually you get nice little isolated colonies that's called a streak plate isolation very commonly done in the laboratory. A loop dilution is done with broth cultures. So you take this wire loop and you dunk it into a culture that has lots of um, you sample uh, sorry about that I was losing my words there for a minute. If you had uh, a mixture of organisms on this loop you could dunk it into a liquid broth kind of slosh it around, mix it up so that the cells get evenly distributed and then stick the loop in there, a sterile loop, and take a little tiny amount of that liquid broth with the bacteria in it and move it over here into this next tube, slosh it around, take a little sample out, move it over here into a third tube and each time you're doing that you're diluting those individual bacterial cells out further and further and then you can spread those onto petri dishes so that they grow into individual colonies on the auger surface in the laboratory. That's another way called the loop dilution for separating out a mixture of uh, species in the laboratory. Then a spread plate is kind of similar to a streak plate up here and you might do that if you had uh, a low number of microorganisms in a sample and um, you can just spread them across the plate typically with a hockey stick type of made of uh, glass or some other substance you just spread them all over the plate and they were already so diluted when you started off that they'll separate into individual colonies uh, just doing that without doing the streak plate like you see up here where you go from one section to the next to the next to the next to dilute them all out all right that was kind of a quick hit the highlights overview on culturing microorganisms um, please read the material in your textbook that was assigned uh, to provide you with some more details and also you're gonna you're gonna get into a lot of the information there from that first section of chapter two in a lot more detail as you move through your Learn Smart Labs activities. The second video lecture for chapter two will be about microscopy.